Hello and welcome to the Spotlight. I'm David Rose. In just a few days, you will hear the roar of the Blue Angels in the skies behind me as their new Super Hornet jets make their thunderous performance during Seafair weekend. Their mission is to showcase the teamwork and professionalism of the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps. But they aren't the only flight team taking to the skies here in the Pacific Northwest. The King County Sheriff's Office Air Support Unit carries out numerous missions every day to save lives and help catch criminals. In fact, two deputies were recently recognized nationally for the 2022 Vision Award for using their Teledyne FLIR camera to help catch two dangerous carjacking suspects wanted by police. Hey, Guardian One, they're at the Chase Bank parking lot, uh, running around. They left the car in the middle of the road. This is video from the King County Guardian One helicopter. Police were following a stolen vehicle equipped with LoJack. It took off and we decided not to follow. And then Guardian One happened to already be in the air. Got two subjects. One's wearing a dark kind of hoodie. The other one's wearing like a blue, light blue hoodie. Guardian One tracked the suspects from the air, saw them abandon the vehicle, and take off on foot. At one point, they tried to carjack um, a female, and so they tried to remove her from the vehicle. And so our officers were able to engage, um, apprehend one of the suspects. Okay, you just ramped officers and uh, taken off. The other guy, though, took off in the victim's car, but he had no chance of escaping. It took a while, and Guardian had eyes on most of the time, though. He's about to run into a bunch of water. Guys, slow down, don't go into the water. He crashed into a flooded river near Fall City Road and Dyke Road. Driver's door's coming open. Looks like he may be getting out to swim. There were only minor injuries to the officers and the suspects. In all, great collaboration between four police agencies. But the credit for the arrests really goes to the King County Guardian One Air Support Unit. And fighting crime isn't all these pilots do. They're also saving lives. The Spotlight's Frank Kumaras and Brittany Perry show us how they train. The citizens of King County travel, they hike, they enjoy the outdoors. The Air Support Unit and King County Medic One provide those opportunities to help people that find themselves in need. You have rotors, thanks sir. We get calls all the time to help out um, in Pierce County, Snow County. Uh, we've gone out on the peninsula to help. If, if we're available and weather permits, we're happy to go. Roughly nine years ago, uh, I was able to be a part of the first mission that we were successfully able to incorporate medics into the uh, air support and successfully pick a patient and treat and transport to Harborview Medical Center. Are you able to sit up at all? They can do a lot more than a drone can. This on like a coat. Put your arm through that hole. With some circumstances, the patients are found by search and rescue, and it's going to require 15, 20 people to be able to successfully carry people out over rugged terrain. So the helicopter can fly over, and in most situations, we can lower down a RS and a medic, and we can start providing that support and then hoist back into the helicopter and return to one of the hospitals. There's definitely those those ones where you've definitely made such a big impact saving those lives. We turned down a lot of rescues uh, and a lot of uh, patrol assistance based on not having helicopters available and not having pilots. We have four. We have four full-time pilots and that's it. I wish there were more folks down here working uh, and I wish we could keep helicopters up in the air more often, uh, but when we're up and able to fly, um, it's, you can't beat it as far as I'm concerned. There's two rescue helicopters. One of our hoists on the second one there is actually broken right now, so we really only have one fully capable rescue helicopter. If we needed to, we could move the hoist over to the other one, but that's, you know, we have to get a mechanic up here. It, it's, it's an undertaking. We're able to still continue doing hoist operations, but it just puts more wear and tear on those helicopters and requires more service and more upkeep on the two helicopters that are in service. I'm sitting in a 1970 helicopter that was designed in the 1950s on a slide rule. Great helicopter, don't get me wrong, but I think it's time for us to look at something that was, you know, we've taken this technology and improved on it, and there's definitely that technology out there. This unit has done a really good job of funding itself on a shoestring. Those are both military surplus. Um, we've only paid for one helicopter ever, the other ones through the years have all been military surplus or trades. 
Um, and then we've really leveraged federal grant money to equip them. Back in you know the Vietnam era, this is where the machine guns would mount and all the uh, all the old military stuff. So right now, both patrol helicopters, uh, one had an, an engine issue that's probably going to keep it down for a while, and then we have a backup helicopter. Uh, we try and manage maintenance with those, so there's always one available. With one being down long term, and the other one just going down for scheduled maintenance, for about a week we're without an aircraft capable of doing patrol. You look up front here, you're going to see an ashtray, which is something you would never see uh, in a modern helicopter. But again, I go back to this was designed in the 1950s and it was flown in Vietnam in the 1970s where your pilot probably had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. We've helped Chelan County a couple years ago had a thing where a guy opened fire on one of their um, police cars in an apple orchard. We actually sent a Huey with um, about seven SWAT team members on it and our patrol helicopter to go help them with that manhunt. Looks like I got eyes on state. If we get in a pursuit and they're up, we don't even have to chase the car. The helicopter can just follow them, and they're just a helicopter up in the air, and they don't, they, you know, we don't even have to risk the uh, the public driving fast, trying to, you know, if we back off, the person probably will slow down because he doesn't think he's being chased, and start driving like normal again, and the helicopter's following him the whole time while we're able to come up with a game plan and try to arrest that person safely without endangering the rest of the public we're referred to as a force multiplier. So when we're on scene, we are, we take the place of 20 patrol cars. You know, we, we create this, this presence on scene just because of the noise and the fact that we're in the air, which has a, an effect on, on most suspects' behavior. I wouldn't say all, but on most suspects, it, we, are, uh, we serve as a de-escalation tool. In this day and age where de-escalation has become, it's, it's not a buzzword, it, it's, it's a way of life in law enforcement that when I started 18 years ago, it, it wasn't necessarily on the tip of everyone's tongue. These are great de-escalation tools. When we find someone who has fled from a stolen car or has now committed a violent crime and has fled into the woods, I mean, we've had calls where there's been guys that have been shooting at state troopers or um, guys who are armed and the house is surrounded. We can see them on the back porch walking around with an assault rifle. We're able to find them out of remove and keep an eye on them so that folks on the ground can come up with a good plan to find this person. The alternative is we have deputies or officers wandering through the woods with a flashlight and a gun and when those two people meet, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. There's no opportunity for planning at that point. And one of the great things that we're able to do is find that person without risking ourselves and without them having to risk their lives so that everyone can slow down a little bit and figure out what tools do we need to bring? What's the best way to accomplish this mission? Northbound first, he's in the left lane. We enhance safety uh, for, for officers. We enhance safety for suspects. We, we create a calming presence uh, when we're on a scene. Our other patrol helicopter, our 407, actually has a loudspeaker on it that we just got installed in the last um, couple months. So even from the air, we're able to talk to someone and say, hey, there's no way out. A police dog is gonna come get you in that thicket. If you don't wanna get bit, just come out. And we've had good success with that. We've had people give up because they realize we can see them, they're not gonna get away, and we avoid any sort of use of force. The one in Bellevue, where we had, the, had an armed suspect at the back of a house, and he was armed with a rifle and a, and a pistol. I think the pistol was later determined to be a, a BB gun, but God, you know, nobody on the ground would have known that anyway. So I was flying, Tony, Tony was the one who you know, called everything out and, and was able to, to create a safer environment for these guys. And again, you know, that's where I was, what I was talking about, where we made it safer for the suspect and for the, the officers on the ground. Nobody got hurt. We were providing that situational awareness to them that they don't necessarily have and, and providing that just to keep them out of trouble, out of uh, harm's way, we can see things they don't, all that kind of stuff. We can, we can see the surprises, the things that may surprise them coming around a corner, um, you know, things, things like that that'll that catch them off guard. So. so on patrol, it's nice because they can cover so much ground. Uh, you know, when somebody, you show up to a call and somebody says, hey, they ran that way, and you look and it's nothing but sticker bushes and stuff that I do not want to go through the helicopter can quickly tell me if I need to go through it or not. All right, they pitted him. We do a lot for minimal staff and right, you know older, older equipment. I think we, you can say that we've definitely earned that. We're the only full-time 
helicopter unit in the state of Washington. There's other agencies that have a helicopter capability, but it's run with part-time folks or volunteers, in some cases civilian pilots that volunteer their time to fly a officer or deputy around. Uh, the State Patrol has a full-time aviation unit, but it's all uh, fixed wing. And so we provide all of the helicopter service really for this region. Um, and so when we're down, this region is pretty much out of the helicopter business. Um, and I think that we contribute a lot, both with our, our capabilities to rescue folks, uh, but also our law enforcement mission. We're down right now. At this very moment, I cannot do, go do a patrol call because I don't have any patrol helicopters. So having something that's, again, in that newer, something that's the same with, with although newer, of what we are currently fly for a primary patrol helicopter would be ideal. So we're never, there's never a lapse in capability. Well, if, if not us, who's going to do it? We're willing to go anywhere as long as it's safe and we have the capability to do it um, and an aircraft and a pilot available. I don't know what else I would do. I think we're providing a pretty good service to the, the public that we serve. And so we've done a great job of not having to ask our own taxpayers for very much to keep this life-saving unit afloat. King County's Air Support Unit is hoping to get funding to replace their aging helicopter fleet. Still ahead, how the Washington State Patrol's Aviation Unit is helping officers on the ground track down car thieves. On any given day, the Washington State Patrol's Aviation Section may be helping troopers on the ground catch dangerous, reckless drivers or supporting local law enforcement. This is video from the State Patrol's plane that we showed you on the spotlight back in June. Troopers tracked Bobby Watson from above before Kitsap County Sheriff's deputies on the ground moved in to arrest him and two other suspects charged in the murders of a family of four. The Spotlight's video journalist, Clint Edwards, talked to the pilots providing this invaluable service. And they appear to be eastbound now, I'll keep you up here. The Washington State Patrol Aviation Section, we get to monitor the skies and assist law enforcement units on the ground. I don't know if that's car troubles or whether he's just uh, not paying attention. Maybe. By being in the air, we can see different hazards that are around the officers, but also when we are assisting with traffic missions, speed, uh, reckless driving, DUIs, we're able to follow the vehicle safely. So if there are any vehicles that do decide to elude officers, um, since we no longer have ability to pursue vehicles like we have in the past, with the aircraft in the air, we can now continue to follow that vehicle and allow to safely bring the ground units to wherever that vehicle may stop. 237 approved spikes, 2052. If we're up, we're always able to respond quickly and we can use that aerial vantage point to make it a lot safer for everyone else. Again, yeah, he's exiting in the 15th Street Northwest. We have a pretty good success rate in locating suspects afterwards. 73 with merge traffic only 21 report. We can find reckless drivers. We can assist with 911 calls for possible DUIs to bring units in. We can assist with auto theft. Each of our aircraft are equipped with load jack receivers, so we can locate those vehicles and bring units in to try to apprehend the the auto theft thieves. Black Chrysler 300. This incident is a good example of how our unit is able to interact with rapidly developing incidents. The reason that we were able to be involved in it at all is the fact that we were already up patrolling in that area. This was for a, a traffic violation. The vehicle came towards us. We were able to spot it and take over advising the units where it was headed. Seattle is now north on 24th Avenue South. We followed the vehicle for some distance until it stopped in a, an apartment complex. Backing into a parking spot now. We were able to see the suspect exit the vehicle. And he's getting into another vehicle. Had we not been uh, there, Black those City. ground units would not have been able to find him after he had left the initial vehicle and, and switched over to another one. First car on your right, right there. He's in the passenger seat. After he was taken into custody, he actually looks up at the airplane and he told the trooper who was arresting him that he thought we weren't allowed to chase him. Some of the challenges that we face is going to be the other air traffic. You know, we're up along with every other airplane that's out there. So 
Um, there's a lot of challenges that our pilots have. They have to not only be paying attention to what's going on the ground, talking on the radio with the dispatchers, but also keeping their eyes up, looking for other traffic, and being on the radio with their traffic control. Starts back up again and continues, and then ends up stopping again. So now it's continuing over the bridge. We'll, uh, we'll carry on unless uh, he does that again. We use a technology called Augmented Reality System, which is uh, abbreviated ARS, and that allows us to have a street overlay over the FLIR camera image so that our operator can just look at the screen and see street addresses and street names. And uh, it just makes it a lot easier to direct ground troopers into a location when you have that information right in front of you as opposed to on another map. Very different than what we've done in the past with the Cessna 182 where it's using the good old stopwatch. It's very limited to time and place of day and then specific DOT markings on the freeway. And right now, during the week, we like to focus on our Target Zero Aerial Patrol mission, or TZAP, working towards the goal of zero deaths and fatalities on our freeways and state routes by the year 2030. It's very likely that we would have a plane up at a time when someone decided to flee from the police. They can be up in the air um, usually three and a half to four hours depending on what's going on in the air, but they usually go out and they try to be proactive. They assist with calls for service. If there's any pending blocking collisions, they will try to go to the area to let the units on the ground know how many lanes are actually blocked. Is it actually there? So trying to be that force multiplier for the units on the ground. If we're up, we're always able to respond quickly and we can use that aerial vantage point to make it a lot safer for everyone else. I've had a lot of different opportunities with the Washington State Patrol and the fact that I can now come full circle in my love for flying and aviation and now oversee this amazing section with my great team and out there making a difference to keep the public safe. It's, it's a very amazing and awesome opportunity. Air support units in, in law enforcement are so slim on this side of the state. Having one that is capable of being up for long periods of time and proactively looking is uh, of great value to this Puget Sound region. The work they do to help catch criminals and especially auto thieves is crucial. The Puget Sound Auto Theft Task Force says there have already been more than 24,000 vehicles stolen statewide this year alone. One West Seattle man is doing everything he can to help as well. As the spotlights Alejandro Guzman shows us, he's using his hobby of flying drones to reunite people with their stolen cars. It's just a big open piece of land just completely taken over with trailers and cars and trash, lots of trash. Tony is describing this, a hidden encampment underneath the First Avenue Bridge, just off 2nd and Michigan. Absolutely disgusting. A place now well known for being a chop shop and where people who appear to be experiencing homelessness are doing drugs in plain sight. Tony says he only found this place after stumbling across the PNW Stolen Cars Facebook group. Out of curiosity, he picked up his drone and started exploring. And that's when I saw somebody walk around with a sawzall and they were getting underneath it like what they were getting ready to do. The growing number of stolen cars turning his hobby into a necessity, very well knowing what it's like to be a victim himself. People who steal from other people, I feel, are some like the worst scum on the planet, and I just, I hate them. So if I could do anything to stop them or help people who have been victims of that, I'd like to be a part of that. Taking matters into his own hands, Tony captured this. Car after car after car lined up with several people going in and out of them, others completely destroyed. Two cars have now been recovered after sharing his findings. First one, there wasn't really a whole lot to say. They, they saw it and unfortunately, by the time they got down there with the cops, the car was completely destroyed. The second led him on a chase. It got to be a little hairy. They were doing like, they were driving on the shoulder of 509. We got into some residential neighborhoods up in Burien and they were going really fast and reckless. The thieves got on ditching it, leaving the owner to find it later. Everybody works hard for what they have. It's not yours to take. The results motivating Tony to return on Monday, except this time the sound of traffic didn't disguise his drone. Things escalated quickly. I saw him pull out a pistol, which was 
at first I was just in shock like what I had seen and then it realized we started pointing it like, oh my God, is this guy really gonna shoot at the drone? Fortunately, it was a BB gun, which hit less than an inch from the drone's lens. Tony isn't shaking and says he's willing to work with SPD to help crack down on this area and prevent future car thefts. Fortunately, it just feels that the police just have their hands tied behind their backs and they just can't do anything. Alejandro Usman, Fox 13 News. Up next, rescue swimmers keeping their skills sharp when a Coast Guard chopper drops them into danger. Welcome back. When Congress first established the Coast Guard in 1790, they were authorized to protect our nation's revenue by enforcing tariff laws and preventing smuggling. Now, more than 230 years later, they have a long list of critical missions. The Spotlight's video journalist, Clint Edwards, takes you to Port Angeles, where they are practicing to save lives. The role of an aviation survival technician, my job, is to work and deploy out of the helicopters to people who in distress, you know, whether that's a marine environment or inland. We're called rescue swimmers, but we, you know, also could be rescue hikers. We could have any number of names. Our just goal is to help people in need. Aviation in the Coast Guard is a big part of what we do best. Training uh, is, is very important. We get a lot of cases throughout the summertime over on the West Coast, which can be pretty uh, rugged terrain and steep cliffs. Today we were doing our vertical surface training and that training is, is to simulate if someone's stuck on the side of a cliff and we need to go and pick them off as safely as possible. You know, we have huge tide changes here. It's not uncommon for people on the beach to kind of run up the cliff and uh, oftentimes they get stuck and that's where we come in. It poses different challenges uh, than normal hoisting over the water, uh, primarily being close to land and it's, it's more of a precision hoist where any kind of minor deviation uh, will cause the rescue swimmer on the hook to potentially get injured or not be in the position where they need to be for the rescue. The Pacific Northwest as a whole, but in particular our area, I mean, they're within five miles, you know, you might have three or four different types of ecosystems. So as a rescue swimmer, our goal is just to be as prepared as possible for anything this environment might, might throw to us. Summertime presents challenges with the marine fog layer that moves in, so limited visibility. Uh, we can operate in the fog, we can, we can fly into that weather. It just presents uh, different challenges for us to uh, get from point A to point B. Port Angeles is super unique because we might be flying into the mountains and we could be in a snowy environment like where we need to be trained up for avalanche rescue. And then the very same day, we could be out in the water and there could be 10 foot seas just right off the base. And if we go out to the coast, you know, we could be looking at way bigger and scarier conditions. Being the safety net for people when they go out and have their uh, recreation is, is, is very important. Um, certainly don't want anybody to get hurt trying to have some fun. As I mentioned at the start of the spotlight, the Blue Angels will be here later this week. Earlier this year, the pilots flew into Seattle to show off their new Boeing FA-18 Super Hornet jet. That's the new plane they'll be using at Seafair this year. The Boeing Seafair Air Show takes place August 5th through August 7th, with the Blue Angels taking to the skies all three days. That's all the time we have for this edition of the Spotlight. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week, and as always, be smart and stay safe.